So welcome everyone to our UX driven design webinar. This is the first in the Form 1 Creative Plus series that focuses specifically on the relationship between creative design and user experience. You can join the conversation through the questions panel on the right hand side of your screen as well as through Twitter. So we ourselves are at the handle at Form 1 and for today's webinar we'll be using the hashtag um, F1 Creative Plus. And of course, if you forget that hashtag, don't worry too much. It's going to be in the footer of all of our slides going forward. So let's start by telling you a bit about us. Um, my name is Christina Crawley. I'm the director here, um, the director of marketing at Form One, and I'm going to be moderating the conversation today. Also here with me are our main presenters. Courtney Clark, who is our Managing Director of User Experience, and she has a decade of experience in designing intuitive user experiences, as well as Corey Jones, who is our Art Director and is a part of our creative team. And in case um, some of you aren't familiar with Forum One, we're a global full-service uh, digital agency. We work with mission-driven organizations to create stunning design, smart messaging, custom-built technology tools um, to help organizations realize their goals and extend their influence. Um, we are headquartered in Alexandria, Virginia, and we also have offices in Washington, D.C., Seattle, Washington, and Cologne, Germany. Now, in terms of Form 1's Creative Plus series, this is something we launched this year, and it's allowed us to explore the intersection of creative design in other areas of practice, such as content, analytics, UX, and technology, um, to help you strategize your approaches for your digital spaces. Um, over the course of this year, our experts are holding workshop series, conducting webinars such as this one, and sharing blog post resources. So Creative Plus UX is actually the third part of our series. And so if you haven't been able to attend or take a look at previous events on Creative Plus content or Creative Plus analytics, feel free to check out our Creative Plus page, which is the link there on the screen. And I'll also be sharing that in the chat room. And, um, and you'll also have that when you get the recording in the next couple of days. So we're really happy to have you here. And with that, I am going to stop talking and pass the baton over to our UX and design experts, Courtney and Corey. Awesome. Thanks, Tina. Uh, you know, as we were preparing for this webinar, Corey and I talked a lot about the similarities between user experience and creative. Uh, we talked about the methodologies we use, what works, what doesn't work. And when you get right down to it, I think that creative and user experience, when they're working together, both are really trying to create a delightful experience for people. Now, delight is a word that you don't hear every day or think about probably when you're doing your work, or maybe you do. Um, but I think that it's a uniting goal for both user experience and creative, creating that delightful experience. Um, and I snapped this picture when I was doing some usability testing a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's really simple. You can see a desktop, there's a piece of tape there, a quarter in the middle, and a couple sticky notes. Um, one very obviously with a frowny face and one on the right with a smiley face. And this is what sits in front of um, like a usability testing or a usability yeah, test per participant. So this is what they're looking at. I, I didn't come up with this idea. I got it from Jared Spool. Um, he's a well-known speaker and author in the user experience community. And he talks a lot about creating delightful experiences. Um, and he actually came to Los Angeles, where I'm based, and, and gave a presentation. Um, I was there with about 200 other folks. And, and he was talking extensively about what it means to create a delightful experience. And at the end, somebody asked a really good question. They said, that's all well and good, but how do you actually measure customer delight? 
And Jared was the one who mentioned this method. So when somebody sits down, you, you put this, the sticky notes down on each side, the tape spanning between them, and you have that quarter there. And so during usability testing, of course you're asking people to complete tasks or um, to think aloud as they're navigating through something, through the product. Um, and while they're clicking around, every once in a while, you ask if the quarter is in the right place. And so they'll be going along and, um, you know, it's pretty common for people to be like, oh, I think I'd click here, I'm not sure what I'll find there. Um, but this adds that element of measuring delight. And what, what he found and what I found as well is that um, it's really useful. It's really great to see people, they get the hang of it after you ask them a couple of times. And, and when something's going poorly, they, they're not always able to verbalize it, but they can sure move that quarter really fast over to the frowny face side. Or actually when something is pleasing to them or sort of delights them, uh, they'll move it up the line. And so um, the point of this is, first of all, I think it's a really cool idea and, and pretty simple. Um, but the second thing is that getting back to that um, point of user experience and creative um, teams working together to create that delightful experience for people. So when they're experiencing the product you're creating, how do we get them uh, to, to move that quarter to the right? And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about um, how uh, user experience teams and creative teams work together, how our team does it, and, and what's sort of the driving force behind it and how, how the, the nitty-gritty details of how we actually do that. Now, before we get too far, we're going to start kind of at a high level um, and talk about where we actually begin. Um, and, and it all begins, we're going to dive right in, it all begins with brand experience. This is where both uh, the UX person and the creative person on our teams, this is where we always begin. Now, you may be thinking, hang on, I'm here to, to learn about user experience. What is this about brand experience? Well. Luckily, we have Corey Jones with us, who's an expert in this area. Um, Corey, talk to me. Tell me, how, how do you define brand experience? How do, you display, how do you explain what that is to folks? Absolutely. And first off, thank you, everybody, for attending this uh, webinar. And um, we really appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you at other Creative Plus events. Now, brand experience. For me, I spend the most of my career in, uh, in branding, and for me, the term user experience has always been very intriguing because I, I look at them as like the same thing. When you think about a brand experience, what does that mean? Well, think about, think about your brand. Your, your, it's more than just a logo, but think about how people interact with your organization on a day-to-day -day basis. All of the touch points in which somebody would in, encounter your organization or your logo and your brand um, that is the brand experience. With, with, this, with branding, you have an opportunity to connect with people on a deeper level. And, uh, you know, say you're a nonprofit or a foundation, people may interact with your brand uh, through the website. Um, maybe they get a newsletter. Maybe they call your office. Um, or maybe they even attend an event. The point is, is this, this is your opportunity to make a real connection with a particular person. And in this case, we're going to be talking a lot about users. Um, but the users and, and target audience from branding are the exact same thing. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we go through, uh, through the rest of the webinar. Yeah. So, Corey, when you start a new project, what is the first thing you ask for when you're working with an organization? Yeah, so first, uh, on first meeting, I, I typically like to ask a, a few questions, but I, one of those questions are, do you have uh, brand guidelines? Um, do you have anything that outlines uh, your, your organization and your, and your brand and, and goals and such? And, uh, and uh, yeah, a lot of people struggle with that one, and uh, typically, typically you don't quite uh, always get what you need and uh, you have to do a little bit more digging. But typically we ask for our brand guidelines and we normally get a logo and maybe a few colors. Um, what you're seeing on the screen here is, is that we have a, a case study that we're going to touch on and 
for those of you who attended the past we uh, webinars and uh, Creative Plus, we have a fictitious organization called the Pacific Well Conservancy. And uh, they're dedicated to saving wells, safe water, safe wells. And so you'll see that we throughout this presentation. But typically, you get a logo and you get a few set of colors, and, and that's, that's pretty much it. But a, but a brand experience is much bigger than just a logo or colors. Right. And I think a lot of people struggle with it, right? It, it can be a, an overwhelming question to, a, to answer. What is the brand experience that you want to create for folks? And I think that a logo is certainly part of it, but when people are visiting your website, attending an event, or even talking to you, they're experiencing way more than just that logo. And so we're really trying to get at the core what unites those experiences, what are the, the key key themes within them. So I think it's helpful actually to break this down a little bit and, um, and go through the key questions. So uh, if you have, if you're at your desk, grab a pen and paper, or maybe open a notepad on your, on your laptop, um, and we can play along at home. We have three questions that we think are vital when starting to define what your brand is. Um, okay, so start thinking. Go ahead and write your organization's name at the top or the item that you want to you know, consider the brand for. So the first question is, what do you stand for? And, and this is like, what does the organization stand for? Um, this can be an overwhelming question to answer, but a couple other ways to think about it is, um, what's your mission? What are your values? Uh, if your company has been around for a long time, why are you still around? What, um, what has kept you going through all those years? It even is sometimes helpful to go back and think about why your organization was originally created. Um, it's sort of, uh, you're, it's a little bit of soul searching trying to answer this question, but it's a really important question to be able to answer. Okay, so we'll keep moving. That's the first question. Second question is, who are you talking to? This is that primary audience question. You know, if you could reach one type of person, who would it be? Um, some people may say donors. Well, who's your ideal donor? Think, think in more detail about who that, who that is. Um, if, you, if you are designing a digital product, who do you really want to download that app or visit your website or attend the event? If you could pick you know, just a handful of people or one type, who would that be? And we'll move along to the third and final question. Okay, what do you want to say? Let's say you have a captive audience now. You've got that person or that group of people in the room. What, what do you say to them? What, what do you want them to know? Uh, another way to think about it is what do you want them to remember? What's your, what's your key message? So these are three questions that begin to define a brand. Um, these questions are fundamental to the work that we do in user experience and, and creative. Our work is grounded in the answers to these questions. Um, and so, like I said, by answering these questions, you've started to, to define your, the value that you're bringing, um, your audience, and your message. And this should be the basis of all your communications, not just your digital products or your website, right? This is something that people should experience through all the touch points that Corey mentioned earlier. It's how you talk about your organization, how you talk about your, your work. Um, and I think w we want to start here because um, user experience and creative design, those are two two ways to extend this brand. Um, so what we're doing is we're taking this information and we're sharing that value and that message with your target audience and we're defining you know, what, the, what the details of that experience looks like. Corey, anything to add here as we're talking about these three questions um, and the, the core parts of the brand? 
Yeah, no, I, you know, I will say, you know, sometimes these questions are, are a little hard, hard to answer. Um, but just, just like as we said, just, just kind of go back to why it is you're doing this. What, what, what makes you get up every morning and go to work? And, um, and uh, it'll, it'll start to help inform these sort of these questions and help you dig at what the value is and, 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 and who am I talking to? What is that audience? And, and then we'll get into the next slide is the, the foundational elements of a brand and. Um, yeah, yeah. Monica, let's go to that actually. So let's talk about this for let's talk about what the foundations of brand are. Why don't actually I was ho I was hoping to do a quick poll because yeah, I'm yeah. curious. Yeah. I'm curious which question if you played along at home or even if you're just uh, uh, checking things out or thinking along in your head, which which question was the hardest for you to answer? Yeah, we'll give it maybe like 15 more seconds. We um we talk we've talked about brand in a couple other venues, the nonprofit technology conference, and a couple other venues. And I always like to ask this question because uh, it helps us figure out where to focus our our guidance in the presentation, but also to see what, what trends we recognize. All right, so let's close the poll. All right, so it looks like we have 20% for what do you stand for, 24% for who you're talking to, and then 57% for uh, what you want to say. That's interesting. The last time, the last time we, we talked about this, um, who are you talking to was the, the top one far and away. So it's interesting that message is a big one for this audience. Um, so let me pull this back up. Okay. All right. So yeah, as Corey was saying, um, when those are the three core questions uh, that we like to think about, but as you can imagine, there are even more questions that could could rise out of this. And when you are actually doing a branding project, there are these four key elements in the circles here that you often see in many brand guidelines, many branding books. Corey, what's been your experience with trying to, to pull these together and answer these questions? I mean, it's, it, it, takes, it takes a thorough discovery and working very closely with the clients to, to sort of dig at these, these questions. and. Um, and you, you know, just to, to find, and for example, to get brand attributes, we would, you know, we sort of ask them, what adjectives would you would you say best describe your organization or or your brand, or what adjectives um, describe who you would like to become? Because um, sometimes it's sometimes it's you know you don't you, they're starting out and maybe they're just trying to figure out who they want to be, or maybe even modeling after somebody else, and uh, and sometimes even starting with what other people have out there and or competitors and and uh, and sort of digging at the type of messages they're saying you know is it working and what's the tone and it, does it sound right is it right for my organization so it's it's a thorough discovery um, and we typically work very closely with with uh, our customers to, to sort of dig at these questions yeah and I think one interesting point is that look and feel is certainly on here and that's where the logo starts to fall in um, and you see this question on the far right, how do you use the visuals to map to your brand attributes and, and messages? And, and I think that's kind of the point we were bringing up earlier is that, yeah, the visuals are part of it, but uh, the messaging and the voice and tone are also key elements that people tend to forget about. And I want to talk a little bit about um, why we're bringing this up as well. Uh, we wouldn't bring it up if everyone was doing an A-plus job on it. <laughs> I think we see that organizations often struggle with this, struggle to define their brand. Um, and we sort of summarize some of the, the key reasons on, on what we see happening. Um, I'll jump in on the first one. Um, I think it's one is we ask these questions or we ask for brand guidelines they say no we don't have any and we start to ask these questions and they actually have the answers it's just not written down it's not formalized in any way and that's actually a pretty decent place to be in because we can certainly write down those answers. Corey what are other reasons that you see 
uh, organizations struggling? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that they just, they have a lot of different things that they want to say, and, uh, and they have all, all these ideas that, that they just, they just don't know what, they don't know where to begin, and, uh, and you know, sometimes you, you just got to take a, take a step back, and as I said before, is, is take a step back and think about why you're in the business that you're in, and, and that, you know, that really does help a lot, and it takes a lot of the pressure off with, uh, you know, trying to figure out what your brand is. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, that's it's it's just taking a step back and, and really focusing. Yeah, and it, and it's tough, you know. Like some this other example here, some folks just don't know the answers. Um, it can be hard to generate consensus too. We've seen groups of stakeholders that just can't agree, uh, and they battle it out, and their their brand goes undefined. And then finally, one of the other examples is that um, maybe it is defined, but they're inconsistent on delivering on it consistently. So, so it may be like they've got those brand attributes and that messaging, but maybe they're not using the messaging in all of their touch points. They're not using it consistently. Um, so that, that's more of an execution problem. I think the big point, though, is that what we see is that if you want to have a greater impact with your audiences and a deeper connection with them, um, organizations that do that have a very well-defined brand and they deliver on them. They deliver on them very consistently. And the last bit I brought up earlier and Corey, Corey hammered home on it as well, is that these are questions we're going to ask. We're going to ask them at the beginning, and you may have the answers, you may not, and that's why we're emphasizing this, is that it's always a starting place for us, because our work is extending your brand into the products we're designing. So let's actually talk about that. Let's dive into um, what the creative practice or the user experience practice looks like, and and where there's overlap, and do we actually need both on projects? Corey, talk to me about, about creative design and, and some of the key responsibilities of designers on projects. Yeah, totally. So creative uh, is, is about, it's about creating that visual system. Branding is definitely a, a big part of the whole creative process, but it's creating that look and feel and really just setting the tone. Um, it, you, it, it obviously starts with those brand foundations and the foundations of messaging, um, which, which ultimately inspire those, those visuals. Um, you know, creative designers, they're, 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 building, they're building the brand experience. It's those final touch points. You know, they're crafting this look and feel and setting the overall tone. Um, can, can creative exist without UX? Um, the answer to that would be, in short, no, they cannot. So, like, uh, you know, until you realize, like, as a designer, we, we often kind of lose sight of why, why or who we're designing for, and this is true even for me. So, I, you know, I feel like to really become an experienced designer, you have to recognize that you're designing for someone. You're, you you want to, your, your designs are meant to connect and create an emotion with a person who, who interacts with it, and, uh, and, and it's, it's, it, it can be something that is beautiful, um, and, and as we talked about, the delight in the experience and, and the delightful visuals, you know, it can, it can look good, but we have to go back to that we're designing a brand experience, and um, yeah, just recognize that you're, you're designing for somebody, and then the other big thing is that as a designer, you are a problem solver. Good design is about solving problems. Yeah, I agree, and I think what really irks me is when people introduce other designers and they say, this is Corey, he's going to make things pretty. Oh my gosh, it boils my blood because I, I work with really talented creative designers and, and they're, they're thinking much deeper than is this beautiful, and I think that's what separates a fine designer to a really excellent one is they're thinking about visual systems that can extend across many screens and many platforms and, and, many, and many different types of collateral. Um, and that's, that's a skill that goes beyond 
uh, just making something beautiful. So I really like what you said, Corey, is that you're realizing that you're designing for someone and that, that you become a problem solver. Yeah. And, and you know, I really just discovered that in, in my own personal journey uh, going from, you know, you come out of college and, and, and you're making that transition into the design world. And most, most, most young designers or junior designers, or I call them art artists, I, I say they're artists, and I say that for a particular reason, because when you create art, it's, it's about creating something beautiful, but you're not worried about who, it's, who you're connecting with. You just want to create cool things and make things, you know, as, as she said, clients, clients often say, make this, make this look beautiful. And yeah, that's, that's one big part of it. But the big difference between an artist versus a designer is that a designer realizes that they are there to solve a problem, that they're there to connect with somebody. There's, there's something special about the, the, the ability to design something that you know that, that could sometimes even change the world or make a huge impact on, on somebody's life. Um, and so, as in my own personal transition, like going from the artist to designer, you know, I realized that it, that, that it's it's bigger than just me, and uh, and and that's that's kind of why I'm very intrigued and I love user experiences because it's a thorough and deeper understanding of who you're actually designing for, and that adds depth to your to your designs. Yeah, and this is where our partnership is really meaningful, I think, because. That's, that's what I see about user experience is that at the core, we need to understand the audiences um, that we're targeting and, and, and know more about them. And that happens through audience research, through usability testing. Um, and I think, you know, for those who aren't familiar with user experience, there are a lot of definitions out there. Um, the Nielsen Norman group, who's sort of like, <laughs> The, I don't want to call, I don't know, I was going to say the Bible of UX, but it is. It's like you go there to see what Nielsen Norman said um, when you're struggling with a, with a problem. But basically they say user experience encompasses all aspects of the end user's interaction with a company, with its services, with its products. So that just rings true to the brand elements we were talking about before. But I, the definition that I really like is it's, it's how a person feels when they're interfacing with a system. And so a user experience professional is thinking a lot about audience. They're, they're planning early. They're uncovering hairy problems with content, with taxonomy. They may be even looking into analytics. Um, ultimately, one of the big things they're often responsible for is creating that uh, larger schema. So I like to use the a building metaphor. Um, so a user experience person, they're sort of like the architect. They're creating the blueprints. They're defining um, where the hallways are, where the doors are, how many rooms are needed, how people move between the rooms. But they also have to work closely with the designers and the engineers who are going to take that work to the next level to make sure we're all on the same page and have the same vision for that building. And that what we're designing, what we're putting in the blueprints, can actually be executed upon, that it still makes sense. I think um, user experience is is a little bit different from creative in that with creative work you can see it like it, it starts to look like the final product um, user experience is much more behind the scenes it's much earlier um, and it's really that sort of uh, as work that happens before and it, it doesn't feel quite finished but that planning um, ensures that a product can be built successfully and so that's actually where there is some, there is quite a bit of overlap between UX and creative, specifically around layouts and structures and interactions. Um, and this is where, this is like the juicy part. This is where Corey and I can really work together to define that stuff early and make sure our visions are in line. Corey, as far as, um, Working with front-end development, I know they come into the picture here as well, and and that'll be the next part of our Creative Plus series is Creative Plus front-end. But tell me a little bit about some of the considerations where you really need to pull a front-end developer in and, and, and work closely. Yeah, I mean, sometimes as designers, we sort of lose, lose sight of 
the feasibility. You know, my background is, is in print design, and I made that transition to, to, to web design. You know, I, I learned a lot about limitations, and that's, that's changed in the last few years. Things, you know, there's, there's great advancements in web these days, and the, the power of uh, CSS is, is unbelievable. Um, so I like, you know, I, don't, I never like to put myself in a box and sort of, and, you know, I like to sort of design and, know, and worry about the problems later. But what I will do is I'll bring the front end, uh, front end guy in uh, early on. And uh, I'll just pick his brain, and and uh, and sometimes what I like to do with uh, you know one of our one of our, our front end guys here, Sean Brackett, I'll, I'll just call his name out. Fantastic developer. We have a great staff of developers here, but sometimes we'll just play around with ideas back and forth in CodePen, and and just uh, just to experiment and see whether it's going to work. But um, but I see them, and they're they're added in here intentionally because they are a big part of our process. So you know you have content teams, creative teams, UX. It's if you think about this, you know I like to think about it like this. There's good ideas and there's great ideas, and I I think that great ideas come when the teams are working collaborative. It comes from different minds, uh, all thinking about the same problem. So you know. I think that the collaboration is is key here. Yeah, and I think it's we we found that it's where a lot of great ideas are generated. Plus, it's really fun, <laughs> as you yeah. can tell. Corey's got a lot of energy and and brings some some great stuff to get together. I think it also helps create a smoother transition. It's we're less siloed, and that's actually where I want to dig in a little bit. Is looking at this overlap. Um, and one last thing to say is there are a lot of diagrams out there that define these disciplines. I'll say that this is not, uh, it doesn't have everything that user experience does or everything that creative does, but we wanted to give you a snapshot of some of the pieces and, and where we see some of the overlap. So Corey was talking a little bit about the uh, working with a front-end developer um, and I wanted to touch on that because this is what sort of a standard team looks like that we work with. We have a project manager, a UX designer, front end developer. Sometimes we have additional people as well, people doing QA or support, other stuff like that. Um, but this is sort of like a general team. And it can feel kind of large. And, and this totally depends on the project. We're not saying you have to have a minimum of five people. Um, but we are saying that even if your team's smaller, even if people are playing multiple roles, the main thing is, you know, um, you definitely need to have somebody who can carry that user experience thinking. They're asking those key questions, um, even if they are filling filling multiple roles. So actually, at Forum One, we do have successful teams that uh, uh, that look sort of like this. People are playing dual roles. What we found is that. This works well. Uh, the projects tend to be a little bit smaller and they move way faster. Um, and that's mostly because uh, these teams work on projects where there are fewer stakeholders and, and the product is, is smaller, right? So we wouldn't put a three-person team on a redesign that has, you know, 20,000 pages. <laughs> that, that would take a long time for three people to do. So, so this can scale, but I think the main point is that um, UX and creative are, are working together, and the main thing is we need to have thinking from both to execute um, a meaningful and purposeful design. Totally. So let's, let's keep going. Let's talk, now that we've talked about brand and we've talked about what UX is and what creative is and, and where there's overlap, um, I want to talk about the execution of this work because it's all well and good if we say this is how you should do it or here's how your team should be, but if but we want to show you actually how we work, how we get this stuff done. Um, and it starts by outlining the audience journey together. Um, we do this for a lot of reasons, um, and they're all listed here, but the big ones are at the top. Um, Ultimately, user experience, the user experience lead and the creative lead, they're both responsible for delivering on an excellent um, customer experience. They're, they're trying to create a delightful experience for the customer. Um, and so it only makes sense that we need to start with the same foundation. 
we need to be using the same language when we're talking about what's going on the page and where, and we need to have the same uh, vision. There are a couple other points. Um, you know, we found that we get better results. Um, we found that it's a much more strategic approach. Um, and like I said before, it's actually a lot of fun. And then one caveat, one thing. So we're going we're gonna to drop in at the beginning of this design phase and tell you how we, how we do that work at the very beginning. I will say, though, that um, you know, oftentimes before we get there, before we sit down to write this stuff down, we've done, we've done a good bit of discovery. Now, it's not, we're not always doing all the things listed on the left side, but we're doing some of it. We're talking to stakeholders. We may have done a content inventory. We may have done some audience research. Um, there's a lot of stuff that probably um, happened before in the discovery. So we're coming to this activity fairly well informed. All right, so what's it look like? It's finally here. Um, so we're going to use that same example. So Corey mentioned the Pacific Whale Conservancy. Um, it's a, it's a, an organization we love, but we also made up um, to use within these uh, webinars as an example. It's been carried throughout. So if you go back and watch the older webinars, this should look familiar. <clears throat> so this is a little worksheet that um, we use that sort of sets the, sets the ground for where um, UX and creative start their work. Uh, so what actually happens is that I would sit down with Corey and we'd start filling this out. We'd start with step one. Okay, so what the heck is it that we're designing? This is, we have the project title, maybe there's a URL, and then we're writing the description together. So in this case, we're saying we're just going to redesign the home page, and what we're trying to do is convey this new brand identity, so new color palette, new logo, all the elements that go with a brand identity. And what we want to do is increase donations and increase audience engagement. Now, um, you might be tempted to skip this step, step. I would say just go ahead and do it. It just makes sure that, again, you are establishing the same foundation and the same language with your, with your creative partner. All right, step two. Uh, this is where we start to talk about that audience. And so, like I said, when we, um, when we first enter a project, we're going to talk about brand and we're going to talk about audiences. Um, when you are actually embarking on uh, a piece of this, we should really define the type of audience that we're going after. Um, and so here we've listed donors, and, and we're being specific. We want to target a specific demographic, so passionate millennials, we'll say. Um, the additional blocks here are uh, sort of to understand who these people are, um, give them some real qualities. Now, this, this hopefully is based on some audience research you did, some interviews, market research, uh, maybe even usability testing. Um, so we like to outline the occupation of the person. We really like to give them a name, and even you might even choose a photo for this, this uh, fake person. It starts to become a little bit like a persona. And the reason we do that and write this background behind them is um, to, to, like Corey said, to remember that we're designing for a person and to get kind of specific about who this person is, and it helps set the context. Um, and, and that's really important. Corey, do you have anything to add yeah, here on this? Say, I, I was just going to say that sometimes people find these somewhat silly, and, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm going to admit, I did at first, like writing out personas and, and, uh, and as I studied UX, um, but, but like she said, it, like Courtney said, it's, a, it's about putting a real person, and if this stuff is really truly based on facts and, and real data, which it should be, it's good to know a little bit more about your users and, and, uh, and the things that they like, the things that they don't like, the things that they do on a daily basis, because, because it shapes the context in which they may interact with your brand or product. If you think about it, if, it's a, if they're a busy person, they're always on the go, they may interact mobily. So then, then it arises some new issues or, or brings up some new issues that you may need to address in, in the design phase 
as well, maybe we need to consider consider mobile as a part of our solution. So it's always good to, to dig and find as much information on your, on your users as possible. Yeah, and I think that leads to a sort of a word to the wise here. Um, it's, it's important to, for this information, ideally to be backed by research. Um, and to put yourself in this audience's shoes and think about it from their view, um, there is a tendency for us to think that we know what's best for the audience or to not back it by research or to not follow up to make sure our assumptions are correct. Um, and I think Corey said this when we were talking about this earlier, this goes for, you know, the product owner, the organization, but it also goes for the creative and the user experience leads on the project, is to always check your assumptions um, and to, and, and that'll help you, like Corey said, establish that context and, and make sure that you're actually meeting that person's needs and not just doing what everyone in the room says they want to do. Absolutely. So, sometimes certain sometimes designers like to like to see they see the next new flashy visual thing and they want to just try it out. But it might not be right for, for the organization that you're working for. So it's so it's important to know to be reminded that you're you're designing this for somebody sort for a person and that's the that's one of the benefits of working very closely with the UX person. Uh, is, is you kind of, you're always reminded of the goal. And you, you may not always agree on certain points, but one thing that you do agree on is that you're designing for a person, you're designing for a particular user, and, and they're there to remind you of the bigger goal. Yeah, I think that's right. And that leads nicely into the step three, which is goals. So this, again, goes back to those three questions we asked at the beginning. Um, who, who are you talking to? and and what do you want to say to them? And, it, and this relates to the goal, right? What do you want them to do? Um, that may come partially from your description above. So we wrote donate, engage, and inform, and then sign up for an e-newsletter. Um, these are common ones that we see with the types of clients that we work with. Um, you may just have one goal, and that's totally fine. You don't have to have three. Um, but we, we went ahead and filled it out fully. All right. So once you've got that filled out and you've had your discussion and you all agree on what's on the page here, you choose one of these goals and you move to step four. So we chose donate and we're actually going to map out the journey for, the ideal journey um, for somebody to donate. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to write at the top where they're coming from. Uh, now this, it's helpful, uh, another thing we do at the beginning of projects is say, do you have analytics installed? Let's get analytics installed, because it gives us some data to work from. Um, so let's say that we can already tell that, you know, from analytics, people are coming mostly from Google searches or from news articles. The Pacific Whale Conservancy is really good about issuing press releases. They have a good relationship with the media. Um, and then Moving on, you're going to actually jump lower down the page and you're going to outline the couple of pages that are part of this journey. So the first question is, where do they land? So we're going to say that we've, from the Google searches, we're seeing that mostly they're going to the home page. Um, and a key part is that feeling that we want them to feel when they get to that page. Now, we've mapped out the rest. So where do they go next? We've said donate. We, we know that they're feeling concerned or maybe they're feeling compelled. And then finally, what is, what's success? What's that final step in the journey? And we're going to say they donated and it's the thank you page and we want them to feel satisfied and empowered. Um, filling out these blocks uh, sort of set the stage for what we're about to do, right? What we're about to sketch. Now, in your case, you may have two steps, you may have five steps. Um, we've chosen three, um, just as an example. Um, but these are, I mean, you could create your own little template and add as many steps as uh, you need. So once you have this, then you're actually gonna start blocking out the page together. Now this can look kind of overwhelming at first, but um, 
what we're doing is we're taking all that information that we pulled from steps one through three, and it's informing the actual content that we're going to put on the page. And so what I've outlined here is what, what are those blocks really generally? Um, and then we've highlighted the ones where there's action happening, where we want action to happen that tie to those goals in blue. And so what you can kind of see is the story that's developing of how we want people to move through the site. Um, now, the reason why we do this, step back and think about that for a second, the reason why we do this is we want to really funnel people in specific and purposeful ways through our site so we can achieve our goals. And this helps us do that. It helps us optimize and design pages in a way that lead people through um, and, and to make sure that they're also considered, that our primary um, actions that we're highlighting for them match the goals that we want to achieve. Corey, anything to add here? I think it's getting, we're pretty straightforward and I want to make sure we have some time for questions at the end and, and we're, we're nearing the end, but any thoughts on how we work together to map out these blocks? Are you muted? Maybe not. Well, in, in the meantime, I've got a quick example of how this might look. So the, the worksheet we'll share with you after, and, and you can do that yourself. This is what it looks like on one of the projects I'm on right now, actually, where we, um, you can use the worksheet, you can use a Google Doc, you can use a Google presentation, the main goal, though, is that you're outlining those key questions. And so when we start a project, um, I actually just do it on the right column before we draw out the blocks. And you'll see here that we have, we, you can add even more stuff. We add sample types of content. Um, we may highlight specific opportunities. Um, we may even plug in some examples or, or cool stuff to reference. Um, but the point is that what we find is by outlining these things, we're using the same language, the design and the structure that the creative lead and the UX lead are building are both, they have the same foundation. And so we're creating that together. And so for the Pacific Whale Conservancy, this is one example of what that full life cycle looks like from outlining the page information blocking out wireframes, getting more detailed even maybe with the wireframe, and then eventually moving into the fuller design. So coming back to this, um, we find that this method is, it helps us create better products, get better results, and create a product that is both beautiful and usable. As you can tell, it makes it, the design very purposeful. We're very focused on the audience and the journey that we want them to take through the site. And, and ensuring that we're creating a design that helps audiences work toward the goals that we have, um, that we have for, our, for our organization. So, we're nearing the end of this. Um, I have a couple takeaways for you. If you remember anything today, I hope you remember these things. Uh, number one, your brand is more than a logo. Um, those three questions are um, really key. They're a good place to start, a good place for you to take back to your colleagues and, and answer together. The second thing is uh, around the importance of branding. So um, we're going to come in and we're going to ask those questions um, you know, from the very beginning. It drives our work. The, the third thing is, remember who you're designing for. Remember um, that we're trying to focus on an audience um, and create that purpose around it. And we think that that's how user experience and creative really work nicely together. And then finally, the thing we just walked through together, um, you know, pull your team together and define that audience journey, specifically the user experience lead and the creative lead. Um, getting on the same page early uh, means designing better products. And, and that's how we like to work. Uh, we think that working together um, creates that, that excellent pro product in the end. Um, so while you're typing, oh, go ahead, Corey. 
Now, I was going to say, blended teams are, 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 are better. And re remember, it's, it's the difference between good and great ideas. Yeah, I think that's right. Now, while you're typing your questions in the chat, um, just a heads up, we're going to do a fuller workshop on this topic in DC on June 22nd. We'll share out the link um, on Twitter and in this deck. And you can go right now to the Form 1 website uh, and check out the details around that workshop. It'll be a half-day workshop, and we're going to get into even more details about how we get this work done, some of the areas where people often struggle, and there will be an opportunity for you to actually ask questions from user experience staff and, forum one, and creative staff uh, live and in person. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, I'll hand it over to Tina. Tina, how are things looking? Are there, are there questions? Yeah, we do have a few questions so far. Um, so we'll start with one that's coming in from James, James Kisner. And he's wondering, do you usually recommend doing user testing before or after the design process? And why? Great question. Hi, James. Um, I'm working with James right now. So, great question. When to do user testing? Um, let's talk about in an ideal world and then let's talk about in reality. <laughs> in an ideal world where there is unlimited budget and unlimited time, um, we say test early and often. So you can test early wireframe concepts, you can test early navigation schemes, um, and what it does is it helps you refine your work and test out, test out your hypothesis. Because that's what we're doing along the way is we, we're working from research, but we're constantly want to be checking that hypothesis. So if you look at um, like large corporations or even small startups, that's part of the process that they use is they're testing um, all the time to make sure their product is in tip-top shape. Um, and they're testing out new ideas. Now, we don't always have <laughs> the millions and billions of dollars that Google or Facebook has, or even the VC funding that startups have. Um, and so, at a minimum, we recommend testing um, before you launch a new feature or, or a new element. Um, and what that means is you, you can test at the wireframe stage, um, because of this approach, we're moving to the to the final to like the creative product quicker. So testing on the real like something that looks a little bit more real that creative design is where I would recommend. Um, the main thing is that you're keeping an eye on um, understanding like how you'll use those results and making sure you have enough time to reflect on the results that you get from user testing and can incorporate the changes. So if that's sort of like ideal, and then what's actually more realistic from, from the groups that we talk to. Okay, great. Hopefully that was helpful, James. Um, we're going to move over to a question from Cassie, Cassie Mead. Um, this is probably from an agency perspective. How do you handle clients who want to rush through a project and skip things like UX research, a.k.a the important steps of the design process? Great question. Um, it's one thing that I always say is that um, at the core of user experience, we have to understand our audiences. If we don't do the audience research, we're working off of best practices, which is all well and good, but a best practice comes from a group or somebody who actually did that research. <laughs> So um, it's, it's, I can't express how important it is. I also think that um, there's a range that you can do. You can do things on a pretty simple rogue level, even if it means interviewing a handful of audience members, even if it means doing unmoderated usability testing. Um, there are some things that are a lower, like an easier lift and take less time, but you're still doing um, a little bit of it, you're starting to get that feedback. Um, 
So I always like to see where we can squeeze in, you know, can we do a survey? Can we do a few interviews? Can we even do some unmoderated testing? Um, the other thing that, um, that always works is um, talking about, there are two things, talking about how their comparators or their competitors are doing this or from an agency perspective, I worked with hundreds of clients over the years, so I have a lot of stories to tell, luckily, about groups who either did do it or didn't do it and their results. Um, and I think also there are great products out there like usertesting.com or testmyui, um, where you can pay 30 to 100 bucks um, and uh, do some unmoderated testing and you get videos of people talking through using your interface. getting putting that video in front of somebody and letting them see how the um, the customer epically failed <laughs> or couldn't find that button to complete their task, um, that can be really powerful stuff. Sometimes you have to go a little rogue, though. Yeah, totally. Sometimes you just got to show them, you know, how things went bad and... Uh, and, and 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 it's a little bit of a little bit of psychology as well, just kind of playing up the the goals that what are you what are you trying to achieve here, and and making sure that they really understand that, and and sometimes you can convince them that, that maybe it's maybe it maybe the juice is worth the squeeze. I like that. <laughs> okay, great. And um, uh, maybe in our last minute. Um, some people were asking about um, any models of branding guidelines that they might look at, and also someone was wondering if you could repeat some of the UX testing websites you mentioned. Sure. I'll answer that one real quick. So um, usertesting.com, and then the second one is testmyui. And there are a lot out there, but those are the two that um, we've tried out before. Corey, do you want to talk about where to look for good examples of branding guidelines or branding books? Yeah, you know what? I, I look for them. I look at them every now and then. I, sometimes I just Google it, and uh, you you get a lot of results, especially with the big brands out there, such as like you know Skype and, and Starbucks and all, and all those big brands. They typically have their their guidelines available to look at. Um, so I'd encourage you just just to go to go through Google. I don't I don't have any particular repository where I go exactly just for that, but uh, but you, you, if you do some digging, you can often find them pretty easily. Yeah, the one thing I might add is that definitely look for ones that have a messaging section yes. or talk a little bit about like the identity of the brand, not just co color usage or photography usage, but really the text of what that brand means. That's where the juicy stuff is. Yeah. Um, the other example that I really love when we talk about voice and tone for a brand is just called voiceandtone.com. And it's MailChimp's voice and tone guide. That's one element of brand, um, but it's it's really great. Great. Okay, I realize that it's already uh, switching over to the hour, so we're going to let everyone go who may have meetings to jump to. Um, but huge thanks to everyone for coming today. Again, we have um, a workshop in Washington, D.C. on June 22nd. We'd love to have you join us for that. Um, and then you can continue to find resources on Creative Plus and the rest of the, the elements of the series at this uh, go.form1.com slash creative plus. And if you do have further questions, feel free to reach out to us. You've got the info at Form1. Um, you can also contact us on, um, on Twitter, and we'd be happy to connect you with both Corey and Courtney directly. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.